That was the last in the series on organic chemistry by Professor Polly Carbon. Now we have a new series produced by the Department of Neurotype Studies at Vicksbridge University. Meet the Autist Whisperer. habit. When we talk of verbal communication, we're talking about words. Spoken and written words convey meaning in a more precise and descriptive manner than any other form of communication. Nonverbal communication describes everything we can use to communicate with that cannot be written down. Examples include gesture, smell, touch, tone of voice and eye contact. One of the biggest differences between autistic and neurotypical communication is that many non-verbal signals are not natural to most autistic people. As we get older, we learn more about the ways people communicate outside of spoken and written words and incorporate more of it into the masks we wear to be less conspicuous, but we're still often prone to making mistakes. We may not understand the non-verbal signals being transmitted by others, and the signals we transmit ourselves might not accurately represent what we wish to say. Nonverbal signals can also have a cultural context that many people are not aware of. Since autism was first identified in the West, much has been made of autistic aversion to eye contact. In the West, we see eye contact as an important part of communication. In particular, we associate it with honesty and trustworthiness. Someone who doesn't meet our gaze because their eyes are darting about is described as shifty, which in turn translates to unreliable, or even potentially criminal. Someone who is thought to have lied may be challenged, look into my eyes and say that again, as if it makes a difference. Why would someone be less willing to lie when making eye contact than not? When we travel east, we find that preconceptions about eye contact can be very different. Eye contact might be seen as a challenge, a sign of arrogance and aggression. The respectful, honest person lowers or averts their gaze, only occasionally making eye contact, if at all. There is no assumption that honesty and eye contact are connected. If we were conducting business negotiations with someone from a culture which has completely different conventions regarding eye contact, we would have to accept that any communication we thought we received from the direction of their gaze might be flawed. Rather than lying to us or trying to swindle us, they may be conveying their respect and desire to follow our lead. Such a misunderstanding could cost a corporation billions or create a major diplomatic incident. How would we overcome such a difference? One way would be to decide that we would exclusively follow the conventions of one of the countries involved. We could say that the Eastern representatives would have to respect the culture of the Western side and make sure they made eye contact when they were being honest and respectful. Whilst that may seem like a solution, it wouldn't overcome the possibility that mistakes could be made that would still derail the negotiation. In addition, it would be completely unfair to the eastern side to expect them to completely change their expectations and behaviour whilst the western side does nothing. How about we alternate then? Host nation rules. When the Eastern delegation visits the West, we all follow Western rules, and vice versa. It gets over the unfairness of the first idea. Each side would take turns and balance might be found. However, that would only be the case if equal numbers and duration of meetings occurred in both countries. What if the closing negotiations took as long as all the previous meetings put together? What if they choose to meet in a third nation? What rules would they apply then? With all the chopping and changing, would each side be able to keep up with which rules they were following? There's a third option. The two nations could decide that since they know their approaches and responses to eye contact are very different, they both agree to disregard it for being unreliable communication. They can choose either to read nothing into it at all, or perhaps to ask the other side for clarification if they think the signals they've interpreted might be damaging to their communication. 
Let's take that East and West example and apply it to autistic and neurotypical people. Most autistic people are uncomfortable with eye contact to some degree. Maintaining it can elicit a response from mild discomfort to actual physical pain. Many of us find it more difficult to concentrate on what we or the speaker are saying if we look into their eyes. It's too much data at once. There are a few of us who have no problem with eye contact at all, and many more who have learned to fake eye contact using masking techniques. Focusing on someone's nose or their eye bags instead of their eyes is a well-known trick. Masking is itself stressful and tiring, though. If NT people expect autistics to abide by neurotypical rules regarding eye contact, it's as unfair as expecting the Eastern businessman to follow the Western rules during a negotiation. It's also as prone to mistakes, if not more so, especially if we're faking it. On top of the question of fairness, demanding eye contact may even cause the autist to suffer undue pain or distress, which will itself make their communication unreliable. In order to establish effective communication between autistic and allistic people, expectations about eye contact are best put to one side. We don't look for or necessarily even see the same signals the NT party wishes us to see, and the signals we give are either absent or unreliable. If you demand we look into your eyes to tell if we're being honest, you'll be none the wiser. We usually look the same either way. So the summary of Chapter 1 of The Autist Whisperer is for both autistic and non-autistic to communicate more honestly and effectively. We have to disregard all signals from eye contact as if we were both wearing blindfolds. Chapter 2 about literal interpretation of language will be coming soon. But until then, thank you for watching.